Hello everyone and welcome to the final event of our Fashion Interpretation Symposium. It has been such a brilliant week. Whether you've been with us for the entire run or this is your first session, thank you so much for joining us. What a week it has been. My name is Fran and I am Fashion Interpretation's Project Administrator. So for those of you who might need some quick background information on the project, Fashion Interpretations is an AHRC funded research project led by Dr. Rebecca Arnold from the Courtauld and Professor Judith Clark from the London College of Fashion. And we are an international interdisciplinary network focused on the ways modern and contemporary fashion is continually reinterpreted through varied mediums. We are seeking to gain insight into the ways representational modes translate and reconfigure the meaning of fashion itself. So tonight we have another jam-packed evening for you with lots of exciting things going on. We're going to begin with a presentation from Dahl Choda and Jane Howard, who are the co-founders of Archivist Addendum. Archivist Addendum is a publishing project exploring the nascent space between standardized fashion editorial and academic research. And tonight is their first public discussion on the project. Their inaugural issue will house all of our members' work from the project, which is incredibly exciting. So we can't wait for you to learn more about it. Once you've heard from Dahl and Jane, we will then begin our roundtable discussion. And all our members that you've watched and listened to this week will be returning to discuss the project. The symposium, and in fact, this event really, is the culmination of a year long research initiative. So it's really great that we can end it all together. We will end the evening with our usual Q&A session. So please, if you have any questions for our members, pop them in the chat box and we'll aim to answer as many as possible. Finally, after our session this evening, many of you will be receiving a feedback form via email from Eventbrite regarding the symposium. And we would be really grateful if you could fill those out for us. So with everything now in order, I'm now gonna pass you on to Jane and Dahl. Thank you both so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Fran. Uh, just to echo what uh, you've just heard, um, we are so excited to be with you all this evening. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, this is an introduction to Archivist Addendum, a project that was born, I guess, a year ago, but Jane will be able to confirm that with you because I think I've forgotten this year sort of got lost in uh, all of the other stuff we've had to deal with. Um, but it's a really exciting project for many, many different reasons. Um, before we get into the details, um, I'm going to pass over to Jane, who is going to read something to you. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Dal. Do I come up by speaking? Am I on? Yeah, you're on. I can't see me, so I don't know. Um, I'm going to read an email that I wrote to myself back in 2003 when I was first assistant to David Bradshaw, who was the stylist and art director for Prada and Renew Menswear. And I'd worked with him for three years, doing six seasons of first assistant styling for fashion shows and advertising campaigns. And I just handed in my notice and was trying to really think about what I wanted to do and if I wanted to be part of the industry. So I wrote this email to myself. So there is no point in doing normal fashion shoots with models because I don't find any of this normal. Models are not normal, they do not interest me. Fashion does not interest me either. It isn't anything, it's just egos and fantasy and expensive or really cheap. Bloody amazing design or really nice clothes made really well and with th thought are things which are worth time and money in consideration. Clothes made by people who think, who want to do other things, who worry about strange things and consider personalities and what is normal. People who don't want to be famous or looked at, but are driven to do what they do because there is nothing else which can take them along the same path. Destination unknown. Make people feel uncomfortable because they spend too little time thinking and are unaware of so many things. Take away the whirlwind and emptiness and replace it with something solid, something so big that they can't look past it or around its sides, something so quiet they can hear the air and their own breath and heartbeat. I don't want to look at young people with no stories wearing clothes because they are now. I don't want to compare and destroy people's work or justify crap work because it is. 
I don't want to get embroiled into a world where people can't see, where everyone is looking outwards and at others, where those who can see and who know are drowned out, talking to people who don't really know and who are simply surface. Reality with professionalism, creativity with business, people working honestly, knowing why they are doing because they have something to give, to move things on, to set things still, to motivate, support, to include and realise. There are things that I want to do. I can pinpoint these things by imagining looking back and knowing they have not been attempted. I know things for a reason. They are not necessarily known by others as once assumed. There is no one else who can do my thoughts. I want fun and bravery. I want to work with projects that are on the edge, that do not consider why they exist, but know that they have to be realized, even if they are never acknowledged. So think of the things that need to be realized and make them happen. They can be small or big. They can be done just by me or with others. They can be done in this country or somewhere, somewhere else. They can be done. Thank you, Jane. Um, you wrote that email to yourself in 2003 on the 7th of October. Um, and uh, Jane and I have worked together for close to 10 years now, previously with uh, Archivist magazine or journal. Um, again, the, the uh, interpretation of the title always changes depending on how I'm feeling. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about why you wrote that email, because we discovered it, I think five years ago, you found it again, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah, Do you remember know. why you wrote it? Um, I think I don't want to. I don't know how honest to be. I'm very honest. Um, I I honestly had had a really horrible time working um, with the people that I'd been working with, and even though I trained in design as a pattern cutter and a designer, and I I knew I loved what I do. I didn't really like the industry, um, how people treat people, how people behave. Um, there were many things. I didn't like that clothes were made from elephant skin on occasion or mm. um, people were spiteful. Um, mm. And I just wanted, I knew I, I knew I was leaving, but I had no idea where I could go or what I could do. And I, I don't really know how to do anything else other than what I do do. So I was trying to, just trying to work out what the next step was. And, and so it, it was just, a, just ideas that came one lunchtime when I was sitting at my desk thinking, shit. Yeah. <laughs> That's because it. I think, I think what is important for us, and I think we've always kind of, done this is that quite often people have looked at the work that Jane and I do together and and think that it comes from this it can appear and I think this is a frustration that both Jane and I have had is that it can appear incredibly elegant and elegant in a way that sort of erases how difficult what we do is and also how wonderfully exquisitely pointless a lot of us that work in fashion media or fashion image making how pointless and precarious this is especially in the year that we've just had I think a lot of people are asking questions that you know Jane you posed in this email I think that's what's so powerful about the things you've said in here and that's why we wanted to start really with Jane reading it to you which I know isn't necessarily um may not have been easy for you Jane but I think it's a really it really kind of settles I think where we're at with the way that we approach fashion imagery the way that we're approaching publishing what you can all see here is a slideshow uh, essentially of um it represents um, all of the different projects that have contributed to our inaugural issue, as Fran mentioned, that will be out in um, January. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. But I wonder, Jane, how you feel about some of the things you're talking about in that email today? Has any of that changed? Do you feel even more, I guess, uh, confident that, that those beliefs that you had then are actually still right today? Um. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm a, I'm a bit annoyed with myself um, because I was 28 when I wrote that and I'm 45 now. Mm. And um, I would say I wrote that, but then I just parked it and um, 
basically did the complete opposite to what I'd written and uh, <laughs> ended up working with Katie Grand at Pop Magazine for a few years. Ooh. Um, and I don't re I know how that happened because she asked me to and I said yes. Um, but I, I didn't I didn't have the like conviction of my thoughts. I, I wasn't sure what to do with them, but I kind of realize now that things sometimes can take a very long time. Um, and maybe our version of a long time actually isn't a long time at all and actually it's quite quick. Um, so yeah, I, I still, stand by what I say or wrote and there are a lot of people in the industry that I still have no need to know. Um, I don't feel the need to network or um, socialise. Or... So Covid is quite nice for me actually. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well I think in I think um, well, COVID for me as well has really made me much, much more, uh, I guess, I'm less forgiving of things. I am so much more interested in good work and rigorous work and important things. And I think something that Jane and I have always struggled with is how long, um, not necessarily, we don't mind how long things take. When we were working on Archivist, the previous iteration of Archivist Addendum, you know, issues took two years to come out. We worked very closely with the uh, incredible Judith Clark, part of this group, um, and it took us a long time. And I think the frustration wasn't from us, actually, it was from other people, wasn't it, Jane? It was the industry, it was the photographers who'd worked on a project for us that it may not come out for a year or two. It was the model agents who had, you know, allowed us, in a sense, to work with some fantastic people. And they wanted to release these images in such a fast, disposable way that I think we became very, um, you know, almost more confident in this kind of perverse thing that we are doing in slowing everything down. But actually to make good pictures, to have incredible research, as we've got from one of the contributors here, that stuff takes time. And I think with Archivist Addendum, what we're doing is, so essentially Archivist Addendum is a publishing project, as we've said before, free from the confines of a bound periodical, because actually over the period, not only of this year, but before this, you know, the printed page, particularly bound together in a magazine, the glue, the staples, whatever it may be, actually felt like it was um, holding together a very traditional set of ideas in the way that the fashion industry has really had to readjust over the last kind of nine months. It's only done so, um, even though everyone's lauding itself for doing, making lots of changes, they're only doing that because there are financial benefits to now doing that. And I think on the emotional level, Jane and I very much are engaged in talking and, uh, you know, trying to understand how important work and important ideas can be presented in a way that uh, maybe, you know, stops people in their tracks. So the images you're seeing here, um, lots of layouts that we've worked on our wonderful Tanayana Erjwan, um, it's essentially the grey bound box that Archivist will be housed in um, will be a collection of research papers that are as yet um, unpublished. So they're fully realised bodies of work. And these are bodies of work that most of you academics in the in, um, audience listening were, are so used to producing. But actually what happens once that work is finished? Who reads it? Are we in a sense guilty of speaking to people that already sort of understand or appreciate what we're doing? How do we break out of that and talk to other people? Um, and I guess the beginning of Archivist and a lot of this thinking, Jane, happened when you worked on Shelley Fox's archive. Can you explain maybe to everybody a bit about how that happened and how that also shaped your, your thinking? Yeah, I, um, when I left working with Katie, I um, was very fortunate. I went for a meeting at um, her agency and they said there was a project going with a designer called Shelley Fox and it was probably right up my street and something that um, I would enjoy. So I, and then I saw that Judith Clark was involved who I'd worked with previously. So I stole the contact details out of the envelope um, because I knew it was mine. <laughs> it was meant to be. <laughs> so I uh, <laughs> was a little underhand and uh, met Shelley, worked with her on a couple of shows and projects in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And then we went on to shoot her archive for her website. 
And after doing that, she was offered a job in New York and so had to um, shed some of her archive. And I took that opportunity to, I helped her with the sale, but I also took the opportunity to um, take some of the clothes and I shot them with Axel Hoped, who's a photographer that I've worked with a lot. Um, and we did it as a project of love, basically, um, to record something that would disappear into people's closets or into museums or wherever. Um, and it was only when meeting Michael and speaking about maybe doing something that knowing that that project was basically sitting, waiting with nothing being, no one seeing it, no one knew. Um, it felt like the right basis. Um, I didn't want to deal with PRs and I didn't want to try and get clothes and fight with other publications and other stylists to get a certain dress and then be sent not what you wanted and a really crap one. Um, I didn't want to have to deal with advertising, um, which means you have to shoot their clothes. Uh, so I kind of tried to bypass all of that and, and find a new way of making fashion editorial in a contemporary way with people that I want to work with, but not necessarily having to sell anything. And as that went on, that's when I brought like Dallin to write a piece, an interview show. Um, it kind of grew from there and it was meeting um, Judith for a coffee and talking about it. And she ended up writing the forward for the first issue and the subsequent issues. Um, it was just only by doing it that it, the thoughts were kind of clarified and then it actually became a thing and then the title came and so it's the content driven basically and driven by a want to do something. Yeah. Um, I think because, you know, there's this sense of, I remember when I spoke to Shelley about her archives, I sort of naively thought that I would be speaking to a talented designer who would refer to her archive in the most romantic sense. You know, so many of us are very much dedicated to keeping things and keeping things pristine. And, you know, PP is nothing new to anyone that's worked with an archive before. Um, so there's this sense that actually when I spoke to her and there was a very practical relationship she had with this stuff, it was stuff. It was also stuff that was holding her back. It was stuff that she didn't necessarily need in her future. So there was a really interesting kind of conversation and dialogue that happened, which completely again shifted my thinking and it brought Jane and I much closer together in really, I guess, formulating um, the concept for Archivist Addendum, which you'll see more of in January. Um, before I hand over to um, Judith, I just wanted to read a quote from, uh, which some of you may recognize. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you where it's from. Uh, a magazine must be like a human being. If it comes into the home, it must contribute. It can't just lie around. A magazine must have blood and brains and bazaars. And on that note, I'm gonna pass you back or over to the incredible Judith Clark. Thank you. Thanks so much. I mean, um, as Jane and Dal have said, um, I've had such a such a privileged kind of access to to these projects um, through personal conversations with uh, with both of them, but also having the lovely role of writing kind of postscripts that were were then reframed as prefaces, which is always the way it, it comes about, that you write it last and then somehow it, it gets placed at the beginning of the, of, the, of the magazine or journal, as you say, you never know quite, quite which one to call it. Yeah, um, depends on the day. <laughs> but, um, but I've adored doing, doing that. And, um, and, and having to look at images that don't necessarily hang together in the way that you expect a story to do. And I know that this is something that is very key that you're not worried about the story, you're worried about the, the whole, but you're not, you're not selling a theme, you're not selling a season. Um, and, and one thing I, I kind of wanted to ask you about that and about the, the image and about the relationship with, with our group is that obviously this week, everyone has been scrutinizing images 
and so many editorials. So, so many of us have kind of poured over um, magazines. And what you're doing is, is asking different questions of that translation of kind of, if you're writing about something, what does that writing look like? You know, is it, is it a one-way street or is it a two-way street? And in a way, and I, I, I don't want to speak for, for Rebecca, but I think one of the, the, the reasons why we wanted so much to work with you on this project was about posing another question exactly about medium, about taking a genre that you've pushed with and against, you know, both aesthetically very sophisticated and trying to make it work differently or work for, for different voices. And so I wonder either of you, whether you would comment on whether you feel that it can be a two way street. I um, think that I, go Jane. You, you go. I think that idea of a magazine or a thing working, an image working, a fashion garment working is, is the thing that actually we're all questioning. Um, and that when I say all, not just us members in the group, but just generally as, as, a, as a culture, we're kind of wondering what is the function or the purpose of this stuff anymore? What does a magazine do? Um, and I think that two way street you talk about was fascinating for us working because all of the content, how do you unify things that are all quite different? The, you know, everybody in the group is asking similar questions, but are very different things. And I think maybe Jane, actually, you can discuss, you know, the kind of when we were shooting. So some of the pictures that you all saw was uh, a shoot that we did just before lockdown happened in March, I think in Antwerp of the AF van der Voorst archive. And that project came about because, you know, we'd seen their announcement on, on social media that after 20 or 30 years, they were stopping. You know, it was just sort of, we are closing, we're selling, we are going to go. And so Jane and I thought this was the moment for us to kind of, you know, get on the Eurostar when one could quite easily uh, and, and record, but actually that recording process with the photographer, I think Jane and I understood how our approach or our vision on what we do in terms of putting lots of different things together that may not make sense um, is quite difficult for some people to, to ask. Jane, do you want to remember them? what the photographers kind of felt about that process? Um, yeah, we worked with the photographers, Sophie and Martin, and um, we hadn't worked with them before, but um, they felt like the right people to do the project with. And I kind of never really considered it before in terms of how my brain might affect a photographer's um, way of working. And because I can quite easily jump from stuff when I get really bored. And, and I, I, I've never understood the, the thing of doing a fashion shoot on like coats or belts or color, or I just find it really dull. Um, so so for, for me, selecting things from lots of different years and different eras and none of it making sense, I can quite easily flip from a really hardcore black plastic outfit to something that's really jeweled and um, all night and then to a white lace outfit and to me it to me it makes sense um, and it keeps holds my interest but I realize that for the photographer sometimes when they're doing fashion they like to have a story and something in their mind that they can follow it's with their lighting and how they place the model and even the model how they're wearing the clothes and how to relate to it and who they're meant to be on set and I'm not really that interested in that kind of thing. I'd quite like whoever's wearing the clothes just to be themselves. And if they're good with their body, then they can use it. And if they're not, then please don't try because it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, that was because we had to shoot so fast. And by the time the model's ready, we only have an afternoon really to do the whole project. Um, so, it, so, it, so it's quick and there's not that much time to contemplate what might come next or the, the third one after that, or how to change the hair and makeup, or should it be outside, or should it be with flash, or should it be? Um, and I really like that way of working when it's right for the project, but it 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 got a little bit stressful at times, but it was okay in the end. Yeah, because I think it 
it shows that you're you're so comfortable with the kind of anachronisms of that, you know, of working with archives. So you you've already been working with um, you know, with objects that are not this season. You know that you're not necessarily you're presenting a future, but you're doing it um, with um, with histo with sometimes sometimes the recent past and sometimes the slightly more distant past. So you're you're used to these kind of juxtapositions that, of course, all the material in this group has then provided for you, hugely anachronistic. Mm -hmm. um, but also with the theme of the um, of the project being about medium, also you've got these games to play, like with Leanne's work, which is, you know, a, a kind of from amateur photography to a digital reality to a painting, which is so kind of mesmeric and precious back to print and back to another kind of production. And so sometimes there are there are so many translations kind of along the way, aren't there? Um, that is any anyway something so fundamental for you. Yeah, I think that's the really nice thing about how we're going to publish now, because when we did Archivist, everything had to be bound in the same way with the same typeface and the same paper. Um, and I mean, money always comes into it and um, practicality is, as well, especially at the moment, it's really hard to publish um, because we're going to be quite hands on with this one, but I, I'm not allowed to leave Kent because um, I'm in lockdown. So can't get to London really um, and do that at the moment. But it hopefully going for like for this, we hope to be able to um, encompass some of what we would like to do, but going forwards, it, it just does a lot more, um, you know, photographers will be able to shoot to particular sizes and some things can be free and some things can be bound as books or, you know, we could put a, I don't know, DVD or whatever the thing will be when we get around to doing it in terms of technology, but um, a VHS or a cassette or something in there that's like to touch and hold and keep and, so it gives us a lot more freedom and people, even within the work that's been done for this, we can use different papers and different ways of presenting them that are right for that person's work. So there's a lot more freedom and it's really, I think it's much more, I find it much more respectful to work in that way. And also we're not necessarily interested in talking to everybody, you know, this is very, you know, our, our thinking, this kind of wonderful collective of, you know, over 160 people, we're a unique kind of, um, you spent, you've chosen to spend most of your evening with us, listening to us for the last five days. That's really special. Um, and I think that has to be honoured in a way, and it will be honoured in not only in Archivist Addendum, but generally I think there's just too much um, kind of, there's too much stuff being produced for everybody. And actually it has no, there's nothing specific for me. There's nothing, I like reading academic texts, but I may not necessarily be able to afford the thousands of pounds they often cost for the PDFs. Or as we all know, I, having access to libraries has been a challenge in the last year. And actually I really missed kind of just happening upon things in libraries on bookshelves that are my own that I already know. So I think there's this kind of sense also with Archivist Addendum is that our ambition is, is, is relatively small. You know, we want to be able to sustain it and keep it running, but actually it's not about publishing 20,000 of these things. It's not about having, you know, it, it, every single shop in the world. It's actually about being very, very targeted with who actually gets to hold it in their hands. Because with Archivist before, we didn't publish, we didn't print that many, but we definitely knew that whoever had one really, really cherished it and read it and might still have it. And that's what's really wonderful is that knowing we're putting things out that hopefully people that ultimately do interact with it, it means something to them, just like this project has meant a lot to us. I wonder whether that's a moment to bring in the rest of the group. Let's bring them in. That would be great if everyone could unmute and turn their videos on. Is everyone here? <laughs> Hi. Hello. Well, I think we, we wanted to, to have this opportunity for people to talk about 
um, how they've felt about being part of the project, um, if it's shaped their research, how has it shaped their research, what things have they found from being on the project, and also ultimately as well, um, being part of the symposium of all of our work being brought together. Um, so is there anyone who'd like to talk a bit about how being in the project and thinking about medium has maybe impacted their work, their thoughts about their work in general? Too big a question? Oh, awesome. Leanne, please, yes. <laughs> um, well, just just recently in the last few minutes listening to um, listening to Judith and Jane and Dal talk, um, talk, I love what Dal said about slowing things down. And I think being part of this whole group has, um, has made me slow things down and see things from different, um, different angles, which you always want to do anyway. Um, and also what, what Judith said about that, um, you know, going from different mediums and back around in, in some ways and sort of seeing also how that's a, a sort of oblique preoccupation with a lot of people, especially now and how Zoom's focusing us to do that for a different audience. And so I'm just, I'm pretty grateful, but yeah, also just, um, and, and thinking Jane about what you were saying, I always, I find photography quite powerful and sinister sometimes. And this whole sort of way of looking at it from different places and, you know, going into Richard's illustrations recently, you know, yesterday and seeing it all um, has made me feel safer around pictures. And that's part, you know, part of what I do is sort of trying to slow down how we metabolize photography by abstracting it, by paint, like doing, you know, detailed painting. So it, it's been really, it's been really lovely. Also, you know, with Charles's films and and seeing, you know, Man Ray again in the patterns of font or what, I don't know, I've loved it. So thank but you. Le Leanne, when you say sl you've maybe slowed down because your watercolors, are, they're quite fast, aren't they? When you're, when you're working. So yeah. what, what has actually slowed down? Is it, does it take you longer to put brush to paper? And it's also similar for Richard because Richard's style of drawing is, well, I've always sat next to you with shows and it's incredibly fast because it has to be. And even in the in the workshop yesterday, there's there is this sense of speed. But then just to contrast most of our other research and in particular, you know, um, Alyssa making an exhibition, you've got that huge amount of time where it's a bit similar to Jane and I, where something or nothing seems to be happening and people keep asking you, what's going on? Is that thing coming out? And you're like, yeah, soon, don't know when. So yeah, Leanne, I wondered what's that slow, what has slowed down for you? Sure, I, I guess what I mean is, is the way that we consume photography is quite quick. It's like a power shake. And when you see something that's like Richard's illustrations or focusing on a film or something, you have to chew it. Like you actually yeah. have to spend a little bit more time with that. And I've found in terms of fashion and in terms of that, that imagery and everything it's just it's so fast and it's and it's sometimes so scary to me so so I'm not necessarily talking about um the physical practice of it I'm talking about how we take in images yeah. and also just thinking back to a time where we didn't have photography I mean how did we see how did we look how did we think about all of this stuff um is is interesting to imagine so it, it's almost a, a slowing down time thing, not necessarily slowing down um, yeah, imagery. Um, Jane, I loved, I loved what you wrote. Um, and I think it's so, I, as I was listening to it, it's just, it feels like the world has really caught up to that um, about just um, uh, less being a lot more and kind of reevaluating um, just what we use. And I mean, I, I just, up until COVID, I just kept thinking there's so much stuff like in this, there's so many stores and there's so many shoes and there's so like, it's just, it feels like such a glut. Um, and I think the last, you know, since COVID it's really, it's forced us to pare down, but um, it was really powerful to, to hear those words. It was just so kind of ahead of, of the game. Um, I mean, for me, it was, I, I'm still processing yesterday, but there, it was so, a few people commented and just, I mean, and kind of Leanne, what you're saying, like the drawing itself will always be fast, 
but people messaged me yesterday and were saying, oh, it was just so therapeutic and healing to draw. And I forget that because that's all I do and it is kind of a set my, my therapy, but it was really lovely to hear that something like a quick drawing can do that for people. Um, so I don't know if that answers anything, but I just, I wanted to really kind of bring that up. Um, Cause I do think, you know, we all need a lot of healing right now. And um, it was just, it was lovely to get that feedback. And I, I think Richard, that really connects with Elisa, what you talked about in terms of wanting to make more of a connection with the visitor through the way that you design and think about your curation. Yeah, I was actually one of the people that messaged Richard to say how therapeutic it was to <laughs> draw yesterday, even though I really can't draw. It looks like a child's <laughs> drawing. It was just very nice. And I think, yeah, it disconnected with me a lot. And um, the fact that I want to connect with visitors also relates to that. But what I really will remember about this year, this, this research time that we had was that I was able to focus on the process. And I never do that. I always think about the deadlines and I'm always worried about getting it done and publishing the text and publishing the catalog and getting the loans. And now I could just really meta look at what I'm doing. And I found new joy actually in what I do. And, um, and I, I really admire everyone else's process, the way they write. And it really inspired me. And I want to collaborate with everyone on future projects. And um, I also just quickly wanted to say that I'm so impressed by 160 participants, even on a Friday. And yeah, it gives me so much energy and I feel really grateful that people take time to, to listen and exchange thoughts on this really niche topic that connects to human experience on so many levels. So yeah, that's all. Well, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's been amazing the number of people who've been joining us every evening this week and dipping in across the week. And it's been really, heartening I think because it is that thing that each of us works individually or with little collaborations and I think knowing that there's people who are connecting to what we're doing is really a very beautiful thing um, and I, I wanted to link what, what you were saying and I'm, I'm trying to link everybody to everybody basically um, with, with you Liz because I think in your writing what's come out is this in a, in a way it's kind of connects to Elisa, Elisa and what you've been saying about um, the ways that when we experience an, uh, an exhibition, we're maybe experiencing emotions we don't even realize at the time. And how do you build that into the way that you curate? And Liz, I think it was really wonderful when you were talking about kind of snapshots, that it's the same thing that you kind of only realize when you ruminate on them later or when maybe somebody else years later like you does, that you realize that how much you're capturing without even realizing through the medium you use and therefore it's importance. Yeah, definitely. Because um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure that there are people who, who, who think um, I've gone a bit wild in spending so long looking at some photographs that technically are not especially exceptional at all. Um, but I think um, I find I find something yeah something interesting. I think you know um, yeah we're always kind of like charging forwards, aren't we? You know we're always like our perception of time is always about charging forwards, and I think sometimes um, for me academia kind of allows me to deviate, you know, to kind of take a sidestep and and become engrossed in something that doesn't interest that many people, but then you know, maybe if it begins to interest me and I can somehow convey that enthusiasm to other people, then that's a good thing because I think fundamentally it's sort of about curiosity, you know, like that's why we do what we do because we're curious, we're curious about, you know, um, how fashion kind of takes shape in the world and how it evolves and how it, um, you know, it how it's a kind of structuring principle in our lives whether consciously or not and I think um yeah that's what I think what has been really nice about this project is it's been kind of operating in the background during a really sort of emotionally intense period for all of us you know um and I think 
normally <laughs> I think of these kinds of projects as is something oh god I've got to get my research article done but actually it was quite it was actually always something really nice to turn to and it was nice when we had um when we've had our events and I think this is the kind of ultimate culmination of that that it's not just us it's everyone else here and I, I had um uh I bumped into a colleague, Callie, the other day in, at CSM and she said, you know, it's so nice to, you know, to have this in the evening, an hour when we all, you know, and I thought, yeah, like that, that's the whole thing, because I think when we're stressed with work, like we need this escapism to kind of remind us why we do what we do. Yeah, like mm -hmm. to take a bit of time out, I suppose, in the way that, you know, Richard and Lisa and Leanne are saying. Yeah, ab absolutely. No, I agree. And I think it's, I think it's given us all space and it's and I think it's also made us focus on on an aspect of what we do the medium that we maybe that I think most of us ignore and just focus on the content and what's the content doing and how do we engage with the content and and I think focusing on what's the kind of conduit to the content makes you take that step back mm. I think Charles with you it's been really fascinating because you it, it kind of has been an adjunct to your existing project on all of these amazing amateur films. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, it has been, uh, you know, it, in some way I, I feel, I feel like I'm, you know, in a foreign country or something like that, uh, you know, among the, the, you know, the fashion uh, scholars and, and historians, cause I don't know anything about the history of fashion, but I, I've really uh, so much enjoyed the, the points of contact that, that I have been able to identify in the work that other people are doing. And, and I, it's really like a, a, a sort of an, an affective connection or affinity that I, I see here, you know, speaking about the, the amateur uh, photographer that, that Leanne, you know, uh, identifies who, you know, who makes uh, these eBay pictures or, or the, the Levi Strauss, um, uh, photographs, but but even you know the works which aren't specifically by amateurs. What they seem to have in common with with what I work on is this. I don't know this energy in them that identifies uh, a little piece of magic, uh, and and you know sometimes you know the focus that we've been been working on today is uh, you know this this week has been has been about fashion and that's not usually what i focus on so that's been really uh wonderful for me but but i think that that what we all share is is that we are finding the way that um that that enthusiasm uh is translated in, into these different media and uh and it's quite different in in film i would have thought um, but here we find these these parallels and and you know the the temperature of that um, that response is quite different too and you know I was so um, uh, you know uh, knocked over by by Lisa's work um, which again is is sort of you know has this kind of vernacular expression quality to it. Uh, certainly not the way that Lisa translates it, but in the stories that people want to tell, in the way that they're capturing something about their emotional connection to, uh, a, you know, a, a piece of clothing. Yes, Lisa, please come in, because I think there is such, such connection. Thank you, Charles and Rebecca and Judith and Jane and Dahl and everybody, really, I feel like um, gratitude is, is the word is the operative word, but also I was I was really struck by, um, yeah, the power of Jane's writing, which truly is a manifesto for for our times, and and what you were saying about the sort of complicated temporality of your relationship to that writing and um, to your own work, and then what 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 uh, Judith said about anachronism in relation to um, Jane's way of working made me think about the, the, the kind of complicated temporality of the stories that I was trying to tell that have to do with, I've written about fashion and lives in fashion before. And I've, um, I'm thinking a lot about sensory experience in the, in the um, and sort of more debased sensory experiences um, in the book that I'm working on now. And I really was trying to, um, to think about, um, 
as a sort of multi-sensory situation. So when, when Rebecca argued that Man Ray's images do something to foreground the sensory experience of fashion, I was also really fascinated about touching and, and feeling at the same time and vis-a-vis and -vis those images and how he transformed them. Um, you know, I was thinking about particular and personal details having to do with smell and touch and sight and even the sound, for example, of, you know, the, the rustle of seven layers of tool. I mean, one of the things I really appreciated here was just the unexpected, you know, just having the opportunity to dream up this project because of, you know, Rebecca and Judith saying, do something with us, you know, which is really a remarkable and unusual and incredibly generous and generative thing to have done that I, I really always will be grateful for and hope it continues. Um, just sort of thinking about how, you know, the passage of time and the complex overlappings and anachronistic experiences of time overlap with emotion and sensory experience, all three of those. And I think that those um, qualities or, um, you know, they're not substances, they're experiential, they're all sorts of things, um, they're ideas, they're um, they have something to do with what all of us are doing in one way or another. It, truly, the overlaps have been remarkable. No, I, th I think they have, and it's there were, there were things we obviously knew when we got into this. There were things that we, I'm sure all of us thought, I'll connect with this person or I'll connect with this piece of research, but it, there's been such connections across the board, and I hope that's been reflected in the symposium. And Olga, I want to, to bring you in and, and Jude as well about I, I love the fact that a connection I really enjoyed that I hadn't seen, and maybe that was just me being stupid, was I love the way that you're both thinking about books designed for children, which then kind of radiate, radiated out into all these other meanings, that there was both the meanings embedded in the medium you were chosen, you'd chosen to look at, that it was aimed at children, but then it had this other meaning, and then the meaning shifted gradually across, across time as different people picked up on the original book? Yes, uh, well, uh, 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 thank you, Rebecca, well, first of all, for uh, inviting me to participate in this project. Uh, it was really a unique experience for me to be part of this, well, uh, collective uh, intellectual effort, but uh, at the same uh, time being uh, well, parts of a very uh, well warm and uh, uh, informal uh, communication uh, be between all of us. That's really unique because we well we all know that uh, well, sometimes uh, uh, well intellectual efforts uh, can be dull. <laughs> Here, I think it was never dull, and uh, uh, everybody well, really was well, very enthusiastic and truly uh, interested. So I'm very grateful, and uh, um, it really helped me uh, in my research uh, because even after I uh, already submitted uh, well my uh, article and I wrote it uh, first in Russian, then it was uh, translated uh, into English and uh, um, I kept uh, thinking about it and now I decided to continue and um, uh, this uh, well, uh, question you asked about uh, well, children's literature, actually it's uh, well um, really it's not um, not so simple uh, because there are subtle uh, issues in uh, children's literature and also uh, uh, such um, well subtle accents sometimes could be tricky. For instance, well, gender accents. Uh, uh, we uh, all know that uh, well, for instance, uh, this boy, you know, well, Vivian, uh, well, he was just. Uh, uh, he wasn't effeminate uh, in, in daily life. His mother uh, just dressed him like this. And uh, then uh, she gave this uh, uh, photos uh, to, uh, to Birch. And due to Birch's illustrations, uh, the image of uh, Vivian who became Lord Fauntleroy became the symbol of a overly effeminate 
and uh, were good boy and boys who were wearing uh, this uh, Fontero suit uh, were received as well, pretty boy, money boy, well, Pansleroy and so on. So they were actually bullied. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, uh, well, uh, there is, there was a big potential in Bernard novel uh, for becoming well, commodified by uh, mass sentimental culture uh, of that period. Uh, and um, that potential was revealed by the book illustration. So mm -hmm. that's, here we see how the medium really works, how it recontextualizes uh, well, the uh, original uh, text. And uh, one more well uh, uh, thing which I decided to uh, proceed uh, just to go on uh, is um, well this um, uh, mass sentimental souvenir production. I think I didn't mention it uh, in my uh, presentation, but in fact it's very interesting because mm -hmm. there were many souvenirs based on the the book and the illustrations, uh, such as, uh, well, uh, for instance, uh, porcelain figurines uh, uh, or uh, well, uh, chocolates, uh, uh, cigarette boxes. No, it, and, it's amazing. Uh, even it's amazing what ice cream molds. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> no, it's amazing the range of things that were touched by this story. Um, yes, you know, I'm yes. conscious I've only got a few minutes left. I, I just want to get Judith to say something um, before we maybe have a chance to have one or two questions, but I just wanted to reassure people, we've kept all the texts, all the, all the chats from across the week. And what we're probably going to do is try and answer things we didn't answer on our blog in the next week or so. So don't worry if we don't come to you tonight, please don't worry, we will get back to you. So Judith, do you want to say something before we see if we've got one or two questions we can answer? I do, I want to thank you. Um, oh. That's what that I, really what I meant. To do. <laughs> because I've benefited from, from your connections, from people who you've been in touch with um, from this amazing group and it was initiated by you and so I think this week is a testimony to your ability to forge connections um, and and to, and to create relationships that now we've all we've all participated in together and I think it's been such a a strange year and we've you know one of the things that this kind of research is 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 often quite uh, lonely and it hasn't felt lonely it's felt as though we've we've been working in this kind of strange parallel and so I'm in all of in everyone's debt actually but I wanted to hand the last word to you as our as our project leader and who's inspired a lot of this work. Oh well that's really lovely thank you <laughs> thank you um no, I mean, applaud yourselves because it's been wonderful to dream up this project with Judith to get all the people we wanted to be in it in it and then to see the amazing work and connections that you've all um, created. And also, I, I don't know, am I wrapping up completely, Fran? Do we have time for questions or should I should we just wrap up and we'll do them in the blog? Uh, we've got about five minutes left, so we could answer one or two. Okay, one or two questions, and then we'll thank Fran and Olivia in the research forum as well. <laughs> um, I will go to the first question then. Um, this is for Dahl and Jane, for Archivist. Uh, do you plan to revisit articles and images from previous issues in Archivist in uh, Archivist Addendum? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's in the past. I mean, Jane and I are both quite uh, staggeringly unromantic people in some ways when it comes to um, archives and materials. And I think that's probably why we can work with them in the way that we do, because quite often we're terrifying um, archivists who, whose job it is to preserve and look after garments and objects. And we're just barrowing in and kind of, you know, uh, with our sticky fingers. And so there's a, our, our relationship to our past is it's past. That's not interesting to us anymore. I mean, 
both Jen and I are living with some boxes of previous issues and we're both desperate to do something with them. Um, I don't know what, but there's this, I think that's what's quite interesting. Again, just sorry, I won't go on for too long, but the idea of a physical object, all of us are now relating to the objects we're surrounded by so much more, obviously having spent the last year or so, feels like a year with them. And, and they can kind of really wear you down. And I, I definitely think, speaking for both of us, that the previous work that we've done should stay in the past because actually it's going to just hold us back and it, that feels very you know i guess emotional actually to call i think i it. think there are definitely people that i've worked with on the past issues that i'd like to work with again on future projects mm. i do like the idea of where we've worked with certain people on certain topics that maybe as that progresses over time maybe even if it's in 10 years time that something might come back up again and we can do like the next phase of something so in that way they might be revisited, but they certainly won't be regurgitated. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to ask another question. Um, one of our audience members would like to know, um, they've said, in an industry that is currently asking, what is the point? Do you think magazines and fashion images must be political or poignant, or can they just be aesthetically pleasing? I believe wholeheartedly that too many people um, want fashion to be very, very political and want fashion imagery to answer all of the world's ills. And it's not a suitable place to do that. I think as a culture, if we're looking for magazines like Vogue to kind of address systemic racism, we've already kind of failed. Um, and this is a problem I have with fashion imagery at the moment in particular that's so overtly politicized that it kind of misses the point of what it needs to do um, and for me fashion imagery I want to be taken away I want to be taken out of my day-to-day -day. that doesn't mean to say there can't be politics in the image or politics in on the page but I think kind of starting on your mood board with the politics which is what seems to be happening with a young generation of makers now actually sort of confuses the issue because as I say I think the fashion industry isn't really isn't the really isn't an appropriate place to perhaps deal with some of those you know horrendous things in the world and I think this is where we keep tripping over so yeah that's my kind of short thing but I don't know what anyone else thinks. Any closing thoughts on that or should we have one more question Fran? Yeah sure so this is kind of a two questions put into one but uh, one of our audience members said it would be fantastic to be able to keep this community and audience in touch in a group or something or in some way. And they then ask what is next for the network? How will we be moving forward? Um, I think a rest, first of all. Um, the, well, the next thing will be Archivist Addendum coming out, which will be the culmination of this phase of the project and then I think when we've all kind of rested and recovered from everything that's been going on we can we can kind of regroup and rethink how we develop and what what we will develop to do so yes there will be some more but we don't know what it will be yet thank you so much um, and finally just one more someone has asked how they can get a copy of Archivist Addendum well, I guess when when, <laughs> uh, when we have them, we will let you know. For now, if you wouldn't mind following us on uh, Instagram at Archivist Addendum, uh, at the moment that's the only home for any point of contact um, for myself and Jane and the title. Uh, but the, our hope is also to rethink and reinterpret the distribution strategy um, of printed matter. So that's something that's exciting as well, but that will come, um, that's our job over Christmas, is to work out how to get these copies to you uh, but the hope is, is that in the way that this is disseminated, um, it will also maybe challenge some of the conventions um, that we've become used to. So it's very exciting. Thank you so much. I think we can we can finish there. Finish yes. our wonderful week. Thank you. So thank you. I, I'll thank I'll you. say thank you as well, and then you can you can sign off, Fran, because you've done it so brilliantly all week. Um, so thank you so much, particularly to Judith, my co-leader. And I don't know if you want to say anything, Judy, but thank you so, so much. And thank you for everything. Thank you to the AHRC for giving us the money to be together. 
um, to the Courtauld and to London College of Fashion for the partnership that they've created. And a huge, big, gigantic thank you to Fran Crossley, who has just been the centre of this project, the one who has kept everything running, everything organised, super calm and wonderful. We love you, Fran. It's been amazing. And thank you to Olivia for helping her over the course of this week, to the Research Forum for all of the technical wonders and for being super calm no matter what's happened. Thank you to all of our audience members. It's really just such an enormous delight to have all of you here and on Instagram and all the other ways you've been contacting us. And yes, follow Archivist Addendum so you know how you can get the publication once it has arrived. And thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.